Last time on Meat Eater. I feel like we're going to war. I know. I introduced my friends Joe Rogan and Brian Callen to hunting white-tailed deer in southwest Wisconsin. Look at her. She is bark brown, ain't she? They took to it like a couple old woodsmen and each took a fine deer. You're two for two on deer. Now the hunt continues. With luck, they'll have enough venison to see him through the year. This is seriously one of the most exciting and fun things I've ever done. I'm Steven Ronella. To me, hunting isn't only about the pursuit of an animal. It's about who we are and what we're made of. I live to hunt and hunt to live. I am a meat eater. It's opening day and it's cold as hell. I've brought my two friends, Joe Rogan and Brian Callen, to the famed driftless area of Wisconsin to hunt white-tailed deer on the family farm of my buddy, Doug Dern. Earlier today, Joe shot a small buck and Brian a doe. This trip couldn't have started off any better. Now we're all back in our blinds, freezing our faces off and hoping to get some more deer. As part of his conservation plan, Doug is hoping that we can kill a few more does. Good news for our freezers. I want to give these guys some serious meat luggage to take home with them. You know how this morning how all the traffic was this way? It'll reverse. They'll want to be coming down to feed in the evening and they're going to come off these tops. So just keep glancing over that way. It's mid-afternoon and Joe and I are looking for a good-sized doe since he's already filled his buck tag. It's not long before we spot a few in the nearby cornfield. There's a doe feed down that corn. How far away? Probably 250 yards. Where do you see it? I'll feed in that cornfield. Oh, I see it. It's a mature doe, but it's borderline. I think I can hit it. I mean, it's standing there. I don't think that's a big doe. I don't want to have you shoot it and have it be a 65 pound fawn, you know? Oh, right here, good job. Get ready. Right below. I see it. She was it? Yeah, she's it. That deer was hit. I saw it run into a tangle of stuff. I was watching, waiting for it to come out the other side. I never saw it come out the other side. That's not a sure thing. But that deer, you hit that deer. But that deer's dead down there somewhere. That's my guess. We decide to wait a bit before going after the deer. I don't want to risk bumping it and lead us on an unnecessary chase. So we make a mental note of exactly where we last saw the deer. We'll track it after dark. Meanwhile, across the farm, Doug and Brian continue their own hunt. You know, I was under the illusion that sitting in a stand was going to be a cakewalk and a lot easier than hiking. But it's its own, it's got its own mix of difficulties. You know, you gotta sit and be cold and be patient. And by the way, you're aiming between trees and you get like a little sliver of an opening and you better take it 
Because deer, I don't know if anybody knows, they don't exactly stand still. They like to lie down, they like to eat, they like to get up and look, they like to mosey, they like to run. It's a pain in the ass. I have to say, my number one concern about you was that you were gonna have a problem with the cold. I'm impressed. You've been handling the cold very, very well. I'm very hairy, it might be what it is. I have a pelt. Another first today is I've never hunted with anyone wearing a scarf. I was gonna ask you. <laughs> Especially in the jaunty, sort of stylish way that you're wearing. It. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a comic from Los An from the Los Angeles, New York area. What do you want from me? <laughs> of course, I hunt with a scarf. Deer. I see. There they come, two does. Yeah. Nice looking deer. Mature doe with maybe a yearling. They're gonna come down the hill, so let's let them do that. Nice shot. Man, that was, uh, that was a really nice shot. Thanks. Look at me looking for more deer. <laughs> this is what happened. That's exactly right. That's terrific. I just shot at my second deer, and I'm looking for more. That's crazy. Oh, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. That's you. Where? Right up there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as she steps out. Come on, darling. As the evening sets in, Doug and Brian make their way to the two does they just shot. Wow. That's a mature doe. That's way bigger deer than the one last the other one. So I'm gonna go and check on this where I shot. Damn, that's a big girl. Hey, I got blood. Here she is. That's a big deer. Yeah. How are we gonna get her out of here? I'm a big guy. At the same time, Joe and I head out to track the deer he shot earlier in the afternoon. There's bone. See bone chunks? From a bullet? <sighs> From today. Yeah. So that was where she got hit. Yeah. So you got a substantial hit. I don't want to mention it right off, but already I'm a little worried. A chunk of bone without a lot of blood suggests that this deer was hit low in the leg and perhaps not lethally. And suddenly another thing's bothering me as well. Earlier, Joe had taken a spill on a slick hillside and said he might have landed on his rifle scope. For some reason, I brushed it off and said everything's fine. But now we've got one miss and one potentially bad hit from a guy who's proven to be a strong shooter. I don't want to push this deer tonight in hopes that it might lay down and die. So we pack it in. We'll be back out tomorrow. In the meantime, we got deer to butcher. If we let the carcasses freeze solid with the hides on, we'll regret it. A lot of fat on this animal, huh? Getting ready for winter. Do your elbow <laughs> like this. Ooh. <sighs> we get the hides pulled off in the barn, and then we head into the old milk house to butcher. I always like to say that like hunting is a way to go from A to Z. A to Z meat acquisition is you hunt for it, and Z would be eat it. So to do the full process, you want to cut up yourself. I hate the idea of sending this to a butcher shop. There was one thing that I felt was left out of the last trip. That was the actual butchering of the deer and packaging it. 
you know, because we sent it to a butcher, and I got it back, and it was labeled with a, a computer. And I was like, who knows what happened to that? Who knows if that's even my animal? To be able to hunt, kill, skin, and then butcher your own meat is truly like that whole comprehensive experience is kind of what you want to say you did. It's more satisfying to, to know that you, you got the animal, you shot it, you cut it up, you packaged it, now you're eating it. You and you can brag about it. No. Oh, no? Uh, that's not what the whole thing's about. I don't know what it's about. I thought that's what it was about. Oh, man, it's about, <laughs> it's about getting back to like uh, the roots. Yeah, no, I know. Would you still, would you and still then, have come? And then come? bragging about it. Would you still have come if you didn't know that that's what it was about? No. <laughs>After nearly four hours of searching, I make the decision to call it off. I'm not seeing anything encouraging, man. Just the thing that goes on. I mean, it's happened to me. It's happened to everybody I know. I mean, you hunt long enough, it's going to happen. I think people like, you know, there's a tendency among people to, to try to just kind of not mention it, you know, to gloss it over. And I understand the motivation behind it. You want to put a good face behind what you do so you whitewash, the, whitewash some of the details out a little bit. But on the other hand, I mean, you're either going to have to accept, I think you should either like come at it and accept things in their full reality or not. And just be like, that happened. That was a thing. A lesson was learned from it. Yeah, I think it's uh, part of the reality of hunting. And if you're going to show hunting, you have to show it. It's a tough lesson. And I can't help but feel guilty for not taking Joe's concerns about his rifle scope more seriously yesterday. And later, when we check the gun, it is off. And as someone who agreed to a mentor role on this hunt, the blame falls to me. Not everything goes as you'd like in the woods. 
I know that a dozen other things could have led us to this exact same scenario. If you accept hunting as a natural activity, then you have to accept that, like nature itself, it can at times be cruel and unforgiving. You might escape the realities of life and death by staring at the meat aisle in your grocery store, but out here, you look them in the eye. With the day drawn to a close, I've got to start thinking about dinner. So while Doug occupies Joe and Brian, I head out to check on my beaver traps. You can see that we got a hard freeze. You can see a beaver in. Young beaver. I'm standing on another beaver over here. Oh yeah, that's a big one. That's a pretty good beaver right there. But that's a good one to cook the tail on. My favorite food of the mountain man was beaver tail. Inside here is just fat. We usually put it by a fire and cook it till the skin starts to scale away. It'll just kind of bubble and scale away. It winds up looking like a burnt marshmallow. And you peel it away, it's just fat underneath there. It's good. And the meat's good, man. Everybody that I ever served beaver meat to is always surprised by how good it is. With all the ingredients collected, I head back to the house to start cooking. Because it's far more fun to hunt than to watch me cook, Doug, Joe, and Brian head out to the cornfield out back to kill some time before dinner. What do you got in there? Cocoa. Oh, really? I know you want some. I want to do sip. That's why I made it. <laughs> oh, Cocoa. Excuse me, let me just make sure it's good for us. Cocoa attracts deers. May I offer some to our host? Yes. He has a cold note. I'm good. Yeah, no, I don't want to. You don't want what I got. You can smell my breath after I'm done, Doug. <clears throat> this is the magic hour. Joe's absolutely right. This is the magic hour. I feel Siegfried and Roy in the air. I call it the killing hour. I've killed a lot of deer this hour. Now you've killed what? Deer you don't know. Hour. You're better <laughs> my, my whole life. I'm beginning to learn that Brian is slightly prone to exaggeration. That's ridiculous. I will say this. This is the most unusual magic hour I've had hunting, sitting with you two guys. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're unusual. If anything, we're that. And I mean that as a compliment. Oh, thank you. So Doug took us out here to the cornfield. Beautiful spot, but uh, unfortunately, we didn't see any deer. So now we're going to head back to the house, and Rinella has uh, got a beaver for us that he's going to cook. He's going to make. We, we just shot four of the most delicious animals on the planet. And what does Steve Rinell want? He wants us to eat a beaver. Yeah, I think I'd rather eat a, a, a rodent with a flat tail and, and bunny teeth. <laughs> beaver tastes like wood. Never eaten it, but I guarantee it does. I have a two-pronged attack for dinner. First off, a roasted deer head. A deer head does not put off a terrible amount of meat, but it's interesting because it winds up being a little bit like pork. I'm doing this simply. I season it with salt and pepper, rub it with olive oil, and add some chicken stock to the pan for moisture. I cover it with oil and pop it into the oven for a few hours. For the second dish, I'm gonna do braised beaver hams. A lot of people eat beaver meat when it's been slow cooked, like braised and liquid, and they think that it tastes reminiscent of beef pot roast. So I'm browning a bunch of vegetables in a pan right now. And I can put salt and pepper on the meat, on the hind quarters and fore quarters, lay them in flour. Now I'm going to brown them in oil. And they're going to go onto this bed of vegetables. We're going to add stock and cover it and cook it. I had a whole plan for deer head tacos with salsa and cilantro, and I was gonna plate the beaver legs all fancy wow. with a nice garnish and maybe a little wine, but instead, things turn a little caveman. I'm gonna try the beaver meat. Okay, now, Brian, you taste that beaver and tell me that it doesn't taste like beef pot rolls. Don't burn your lip. I'll be honest, it's way more tender than beef. 
It's actually a little better than beef. It's like yeah. better than beef. It's, it's more tender. Like, and that is when Joe have? breaks out the back yep. strap. This means, oh. look at that, look at that, it looks oh, like a piece of tuna. Oh, come on. Sashimi, man. Oh. Oh. Every time, we when we see deer meat, we make this noise. Oh. oh. Look at that. Oh, it's a piece of red gold right there, guys. Red gold. Look at that. That's like, that's sashimi grade sushi tuna. It's sashimi grade tuna, but it's deer meat. You can eat it raw, which I would do in a heartbeat. I mean, how do you not love deer when you can, when you can eat this kind of meat? If everybody ate deer meat the way it's being cooked right now, the problem is that people would be drawing tags for deer. <laughs> It'd be a lottery because everybody would be eating deer meat. After the quiet dinner that I'd planned, I was fixing to sit down and discuss what this hunt meant, what we learned, and all that. But four hungry guys standing in a tiny kitchen eating fresh meat is what this hunt meant, and it reflects what we learned. We braved the elements, acquired food, had some laughs, enjoyed each other's company, and ultimately brought it all together with a standing, impromptu meal of America's original meat, whitetail. If that's not what deer camp is meant to be, I'm not sure what is.